Yeah, good afternoon and welcome to the Living Marriage chapter number 18. This is actually um, part three of section five, the last uh, part of section five. It's called physicality for its own sake. I feel like we're always talking about it, so back and forth. Like I said in the last lecture, um, the author keeps on rehashing and rehashing and rehashing the same idea. It's not for the enjoyment. It's supposed to, as he says, the point of enjoying the bedroom is supposed to bring you together, to unite your souls together, to make yourself a shalim because you're a man and she's a woman and you can't be a woman and she can't be a man. Let's listen to some of the, you know, the liberals today, the transgenders, you know, it's possible to be anything you want, to identify as anything you want. But according to the author, you can't, <laughs> so you have to be a man and a woman together. Um, you can be shalim then. And then you could have the Shekhinah Bishora on you, which I've mentioned many times, sounds kind of spiritual to me. Um, so this chapter, he focuses on the evil of physicality, not the positive nature of physicality binding you together, binding your souls together. What is so terrible about physicality? He starts off with the great-grandfather of impurity. Now, if you translate that into Hebrew, which is, I think this book is a translation from a Hebrew book, Binyan Abay, is Aviyavos Atumah. The reason he brings us in, I believe, is the Chazanish. Um, he writes, he has a letter once where he wrote, there are six things that you should be really careful. His six, like, savas, the Chazanish. One of them is he called eating for tainu. Um Eating, I think he tried, except for a bachar in yeshiva. It was like one of the six aviyavos uh, um, One of the six things you should avoid. Aviyavos atuma, he says, the great-grandfather of Tumah. Aviyavos atuma is a reference to, you know, the halachas of Tuma and Tara when it comes to being touching a dead person. A dead person needs to not be able to Tuma. Uh, the worst thing he says is Achila for Taino, eating for enjoyment. Um, so he, the author, takes that Chazanish and applies just like eating extra or eating foods that, you know, that are Taibetic, you know, really that are, taste really good, delicious foods. You know, you shouldn't eat any delicious foods when you're learning in yeshiva because it takes away from your learning he says it pulls a person away the physicality pulls him away from his learning um he says also that's in the bedroom also you know there's a lot more taiva for the bedroom than there is for eating uh even though eating really is you know i think it i i i personally think eating is, eating is a more stronger desire than the bedroom more basis desire because you need to eat right on a constant basis if you don't eat for a couple hours a day you're going crazy, right? A person can go a day or two without being together with his wife. Many people go their whole lives without being married with a woman or even being together with a woman, a lot of people. So, um, he said, chasing physical possessions for their own sake is the great grandfather of all impurity and is the polar opposite of Kedusha. He brings the root of separation. Surely there is no more effective way to annihilate Shalom Bayes in the pursuit of physicality as an end in itself. The reason for this has been explained by Shalom Melech and Mishle, where he states, Lataiva Yavakish Nifrod, desire wants separation. This means that pursuit of completely physical desire is leads one to simply use everything around him for his own pleasure, which reduces inner state described as separateness, the opposite of unification. This is easy to understand if we consider that love, an expression of unity that brings one to feel the needs of others as if they were his own, is the exact opposite of pursuing desires, which involves using others to fulfill one's pleasures. When this happens in a marriage, the possibility of unifying with the others is removed. True shalom bias rests exclusively on a couple's unity. And as Rabbeinu and Nisim taught, a couple's physical desires are the primary facilitator of shalom bias. However, when physicality is twisted such that each is simply using their spouse to fulfill their own desires, the foundation is destroyed and their potential unity is replaced with complete separation. Now, I feel this is an important distinction to make. In the last chapter, he compared the bedroom to eating. Sometimes in Chazal, it seems that they call being together with your wife eating. Um, they are similar. They're both, you know, the most primal desires of human beings. Um, but they're really, really different. And I think that the difference between the word taiva with a, a bays, ta, which also is tav, teavon in Hebrew means to have uh, an appetite. When you say, you know, the teavon here in Hebrew, they don't have, they have a word in English for it. They say, enjoy your meal, you know, or French bon appetit. You know, people say this classy thing to say before you start eating. You should eat foods that you enjoy. When you're hungry, you should eat. It's a mitzvah. You're supposed to eat things to keep you alive. And I believe you're supposed to enjoy food also. 
The problem with food is that I think that's what Shlomo Melech. Taiva Yivakish Nifra. Food could also be a taiva with a vav. And a vav means like a hook, I think, in the, in the, in the Torah. You use the word vav in the Mishkan. A hook. A vav is like a straight pole. You know, basically, a vav is a person without arms, without his feet. Uh, a person hanging on a hook, meaning when a person runs after food, you see this in some people. Some people, they can't control themselves when it comes to food. Some ruggalach, more some people you see they have problems. A lot of people have this problem. You know, when they get married, they go overweight. I, I, I you know, I, I gained a lot of weight. Uh, I, everyone gains a lot of weight when you get married. Um, you know, but I struggle. Like everyone struggles with this. You know, taking another piece of cake, taking. It's very hard. There's a strong desire to overeat, to eat things. That tastes good, even though you really don't like them or don't need them. Um, that's why so many people are struggling with obesity and things like that. Even though no one wants to appear overweight, it doesn't look good. It's not healthy for you. But people do it anyway. That's taiva. Taiva, everyone knows that's bad. And for food, right, There, are, you have to control yourself. I, I don't know how to say this. And part of controlling yourself is to learn what you like. I don't think it means you should eat bland food. As he said in the last chapter, the doctor told him, he said... The healthiest food for children and for adults also is the food they like. And that's what you should. You should fill up and eat food that you like. But food is very difficult. And food you have to be very careful with. You do. I agree with you. You have to be very careful. It's inevitable. You're going to eat. You have to eat to survive. But control yourself when you go to that smorgasbord. Not not to eat, but make sure you eat only the foods you like. Fill yourself on the foods you like. And don't just eat everything, sample everything at the smorgasbord, you know. You can't or, or, or fill up on those hors d'oeuvres, you know. You gotta, you gotta, you know, and you have to worry. You're gonna get a steak at the at the main dinner, so you know, it requires a lot of self control. Eating it does, and you see people that overeat or people that have problems um, with controlling their desire to eat. They end up right in a corner, you know, eating uh, their sushi or their ruglach in a corner, and they really are separate from other people. If you want to, you know, a lot of people have this problem. They're at a meal and they just keep on taking food and food and food. They're not talking to anybody. They're just eating. And really, that's what the Pasuk is saying. When a person has problems with eating, he'll end up by himself. He'll end up in a corner by himself. He's not going to talk to people. And if he's at a social event, he's just going to be busy scouring the different tables and will not talk to anybody, will not socialize. However, I do believe when it comes to the bedroom, when it comes to intimacy, it's exactly the opposite. Um... I don't agree with him at all. He says, uh, an abomination with the permission of the Torah. This is basically the Ramban um, in the beginning of Parsh Kedoshim. He calls someone a novel versus a Torah. The Torah forbids 600, well, the Torah forbids the 365 things. And But we have to add on to that, right? The things that are mutter, you have to be makadish yourself, mutterlach. You have to make yourself holy with what's mutter. So the Ramban interprets that is that you have to add on extra gedarim, extra fences, so you shouldn't come to do the isurim. You shouldn't come to do the arayas. So if you incorporate that into the bedroom, he says, there are certain things in the bedroom which you have to make sure to build gedarim, to build fences, that you shouldn't come to run astray when it comes to this desire, the desire for women, and a woman's desire for men. You have to be careful to make fences over here. He writes, unfortunately, in today's society, many Torah homes have been infected with foreign concepts of quote-unquote intimacy that come from cultures that glorify the pursuit of pleasures. While the details of this disease are not fitting to be mentioned in this work, anyone with eyes in their head should find it simple to distinguish in the beautiful nature that Shem planted within his creation and the influence of the evil that allows man to become less than an animal. So, without explaining the particulars, because... He doesn't want to talk about the particulars, even though it's super important, because otherwise you ruin the, he says you ruin the entire relationship, you ruin your marriage, if you're just in it for the physical pleasure. So somehow you have to be controlled in the bedroom, and you have to, you know, I don't know, you have to put enough, because he says physicality is very important in the bedroom, enjoyment is important in the bedroom, but not as it ends to itself, rather as a facilitator to bind you together with your wife, to unify in, I guess, a spiritual way. So you have Shlemus, man and a woman, and the Shekhinah should be resting in your house. Um, how do you draw the line? Where are you drawing the line? He doesn't even say. He doesn't even talk about these things. He said, I'm not going to talk about them. 
And he says you have to draw some sort of line. He brings the words from the Ravid. <clears throat> the Ravid says, if you're not careful with building these gedarim, right, then you're going to come to do more, and you're going to want more and more, and eventually you're going to do avodah zara. You're going to you're going to run after ladies, you're going to prostitutes. He doesn't say prostitutes, but you're going to you're going to run after and do the, all the arayim. You can even do avodah zara. You're going to deny Hashem, right? <clears throat> If you're going to tell me that you have to do these things, and he's saying it's so important to distinguish the, what is necessary enjoyment and what's uh, exorbitant or unnecessary enjoyment. If you don't make the right, exactly, distinguish exactly, you're going to lead yourself astray to the worship of what is Zara. So at least give me some guidelines and tell me exactly what, you know, where I should draw the line. He says every person basically should know in their heart and their mind where to draw the line. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I can't. I, it's, it's hard to say that you, you should be able to draw the line because I'll tell you, the first time if you're in the bedroom and you say, oh, this is too much taiva, this is too much physical pleasure, I have the exact amount. First of all, the Gemara says in many places, right? Who can draw the line in these places? And just the mentality of someone who acts like that will end up erring on the side of caution. And will not engage in physicality, and they're going to hurt their their marriage more than help it. I believe, because they're going <clears> to. <throat> anytime you do not engage in enjoying yourself in the bedroom, that means your wife is going to not get enjoy it also. Because um, if you're withdrawing, she's going to withdraw also. Um, so you're not going to please your wife. You're not going to make your wife happy. You're not going to make yourself happy also, because no one is perfect, and no one could distinguish so precisely exactly where is going overboard and where is exactly what you need in order to form a union. You know, you have to, the point is form a union. What union are you talking about? You know, is, is the whole point of the bedroom just to be together and there's no foreplay? Is that, is that what he, he said? The foreplay is, is important before POC talked about, you know, verbal and physical. So, I mean, anyone who's been in the bedroom, to draw the line, I mean, you have to give me exact guidelines and tell me where to draw the line. It's different for every person. It's kind of crazy, and if you're gonna if you're gonna try to do this, you're gonna end up uh, ruining yourself and ruining your marriage and ruining your wife. She won't enjoy, you won't enjoy, and you'll probably be caught up and make yourself crazy, probably. So <clears throat> that's another reason that I disagree with the author in terms of saying in the bedroom, um, physicality is not the end to itself. To say that physicality is important just to make a you just to make you shalim with your wife and to care about her needs and to make you a whole person and to bring the shechina. No, you can't distinguish like that. And if you're not going to distinguish, so go all the way. It's all or nothing. And the all or nothing is say, yes, the entire purpose of the bedroom is to enjoy it. And the more you can enjoy it, the more you could uh, exaggerate or the more you could um, enlarge, uh, you can grow the enjoyment in the bedroom, the more it's better for your marriage and it's better for you. Now, obviously, people who just do what they want in the bedroom, you know, with their wives, you know, we're talking about in a mother state. You're right, some men um, won't do the proper piece or play. They'll be too, they'll want to end it very quickly. Okay, but this is natural, this is normal. You're supposed to do what's natural and normal. And there's also a ksuba, and you have to take your wife's uh, rights and her desires into account. If you're a good husband, You'll try to do that and try to control yourself a little bit. But I don't think it's in terms of you should deny yourself enjoyment. Some of the things he doesn't mention over here, you know, I, I'm assuming according to the author, probably the whole concept of lingerie is probably forbidden, according to him. Um, there's other things, you know, there's a lot, there's it, there's a whole, you know, what he's talking about from the, the foreign and, and non-Jewish world, um, I believe, I, I don't think you should necessarily watch R-rated movies or watch porn or things like that, but um, if you happen when you're younger to have seen things like that um, and you know about things like that, and I think God puts into every person the ability to know, to need to know what is out there, um, I think you should uh, invest in that, especially in a, a monogamous relationship where you're married to someone for a while, you need to refresh something talk about it in a second. You need to keep it fresh. You keep it something new. You have to change it up a little bit. So <clears throat> do things, you know, like role play and um, 
uh, lingerie and playing a game of cards or something like that, strip poker, things like that. You know, there's tons of things, uh, blindfolds, handcuffs. These things, you know, are necessary. They're more necessary the longer you're married, I think, because you have to keep it fresh. Um, there's also different positions um, that a man might enjoy, a woman might, might enjoy. Um, there's a lot of things, and there's a lot, there's a whole wealth of knowledge about this. Um, there should be some way to access this, people that don't know about these things. More people should be talking about this. I'm the first one to talk about it. I'm not from, uh, I keep calling me from that I talked about these things, but, you know, Hasra I just talk about these things. But this is true. This is necessary. He brings over here, it says, don't follow after your heart. <clears throat> this is a Gemara in the Dharam. It's repeated many times in Chazal. Um, it says, Now, people think right, going after your heart is going after a prostitute or something like that. It's talking about when you're with your wife, you shouldn't think about a different woman. Now, <clears throat> the reason that he understands what Rebbe is saying is... You shouldn't think of another woman over here because you're going after physicality over here. You're going after another woman. No. The simple explanation is that, uh, first of all, <laughs> I find this is what he writes over here is very funny. He says, many people are happily married, cannot begin to fathom Rebbe's warning. After all, if a person is happily married to the wife he loves, how is it possible to think of another woman? Who are asking him these questions? I wonder who, who the, the, the Avrechim. They don't care about about enjoying the bedroom. They just care about the Gemara. Sorry, any man who's been married, <laughs> even for you know any man, even the first year of marriage, men think about other women. I mean, just that's the nature of the world, you know. Especially after a year of marriage, you know, men are, are pretty much done with their wives. Unfortunately, that's the way it is. I'm not saying you should get divorced, but this is just the way of the world. You know, unfortunately, the world practices monogamy, at least the Western society. So. You kind of stuck. It's marriage favors the woman tremendously in our society. Women could be happy, as I mentioned, with one man if they're married to the right man. It's very hard to find a good man that you're going to really love and be happy. But if they find that man, they can be married to that man. It's, the Gemara says, right? A woman could be, she can't be married to more than one man. But a man has for sure, the Gemara, Yvamos is full of it. All over, a man can be married more, more than one wife. A lot of Prakim and Yvamos talk about it. He was married to two wives, three wives, four wives. So you're married to many wives. That's not normal. It's normal talk in the Gomorrah. In modern society, it's Halila or Baltaiva, if you think about these things. But <clears throat> uh, how does a person even think about another woman? I'm sorry, wake up. That's men. They're always thinking about other women. They're thinking about being in bed with multiple women, a lot of men. So you know, at the same time, so <laughs> if you're a man who engages in your in sex for the pleasure and thinks of it, in the proper mindset, I believe that's the proper mindset. So automatically, he's going to think about these things. I don't know who's asking these questions. And he says, unfortunately, there are those who find this idea to be a great challenge. There are people, the ones that are wives, they think about the other wife, another white woman. Now, the reason Rebbe says this, you shouldn't think about another woman, is because it ruins the relationship with that woman that you're with, right? If you're with a woman, she looks one way, and you're thinking about a woman who looks a different way. You know, your imagination is going to run counter to the reality in front of you. So you're just going to confuse yourself and ruin the relationship, whatever relationship, even though you might want to also have another woman or be with a different woman. Right? You're going to ruin whatever you have here because your imagination can only take you so far. So I think that's what Rabbi says. You shouldn't go after another woman when you're with another woman. He also brings over here another Chazal. Lo a divorced man marries a divorced lady, right? He's, Gemara recommend, doesn't recommend it. Now, if you're divorced, probably you're only going to be able to remarry someone who's divorced, but it's not the best situation. Why? Because when you have a divorced man and a divorced woman, they each had previous relationships with a different spouse. So he says also this applies to Bali Chuva, who had intimate relationships that were also, you know, before their marriage. Uh, and they're thinking about other ladies, and that's why it's difficult. doesn't mean you shouldn't get remarried. He's just saying um, it, it's best to avoid that situation um, because you're thinking about it. It's a challenge. It is a challenge. Um, at the end, he says, keeping focus 
let's recall what we learned at the beginning of this chapter and connect it to what we're learning at the beginning of this book. A couple of intimacy opens a path that can lead to two opposite worlds. The primary determinant of which path a person will follow depends on whether he is on a quest for physical pleasures for their own sake or if he is using them as a means to increase his unity with his wife. Proper marriage or Isha embraces the world of love and holiness as a couple uses their physical drives to increase their oneness. Hashem unifies them until they become like one unified creation which is called Adam. However, immorality, which is generally rooted in the quest for pleasure as an end in itself, brings one to impurity and separation and annihilates the foundation of Shalom Bias. So as I mentioned a hundred times, I'll say a hundred and first time, I disagree with the author. The whole purpose, if you try to distinguish what is necessary, what's not necessary, I want you to story about somebody um, who was with his wife. They were on vacation or something like that. And... You know, they were in the jacuzzi or something like that, and the wife wanted to take off her clothes, and the husband said, you know, top you can take off, the bottom you can't take off. You know, because so, he was worried, he was an abrik, he was worried about, you know, too much taiva or something like that. And the wife was insulted, you know, she was insulted. She wanted to be comfortable with her husband, but her husband wouldn't let her be comfortable. And I want to tell you the truth, the truth really about this, that people confuse this with eating. Um, when a man is... Um, this is, you know, this is what really, you know, why it is that marriage favors a woman is that a woman likes a strong man. Most men are weak. Most men are very weak. They're weak in personality, weak in strength. And above all, weak when it comes to being a master over a woman, to controlling a woman. Women are able to make decisions quicker. They're more in this world. Men, their minds tend to wander in the Gemara, in business. They're not focused in this world. And women who are so good and so focused on this world, they're going to make decisions quicker than men. They're going to be stronger than men in their personalities. And and one of the weaknesses of man is that, you know, it's very hard for a man to walk over to a good-looking lady. Now, we don't have this in the Shidduch system, which facilitated dating, but to walk over to the bar to a woman, and it's very, it's very hard. What do you say to her? People, men, you know, are scared as anything. They'd rather, you know, jump off a bridge than do that even though they would want the good-looking woman, but it's very hard for them to do that because any time, because the strong desire that men have for a woman um, represents a weakness, right? Not, not you should have the desire, but if it's too much for you, right? If you're the person who's walking down the street and you see a beautiful lady and you go to the other side of the street, right? That's not a void, that's not Kedusha. That just means she's too much for you. You're a weak man. So it's sad to say, but it's revealing inside of you that if you, you you look away, you have to close your eyes, you take off your glasses in the street. It shows how you're weak. It's just, it's just showing you how the woman is stronger than you. Her beauty, you know, is is much stronger than you. You're weak compared to her beauty. Um, the ultimate purpose in the Torah, it says at the beginning of creation, right? The kivshua, right? you're supposed to be kovesh a woman, to conquer a woman. That's the hardest thing to do in the Torah, you know. Even men in marriages, you know, they always say, you know, who's the boss? The boss is the wife. You listen to what the wife says. You want a happy marriage, listen to the wife. Almost no men are able to rule over their wives, you know, for the reasons I mentioned about decision making. Men are weak to the beauty. If they have a beautiful wife, they're also weak to that. And, you know, people who try to avoid uh, the physicality and try to avoid the enjoyment in the bedroom, uh, the reason they're doing this is not out of kedusha; it's out of a weakness. They they're not stronger than their wives, and their wife's beauty is stronger than them, and they can't control themselves among around their wife. It's just it's just a, a simon. They say Nishiva is a simon or a si, but it's not a reason. It's a simon. It's a it's a sign that <clears throat> they're they're weak. A husband is weak. If a husband is walks in the street without his glasses on, he's just representing that he's a very weak when it comes to women, you know. If he's able to walk past the woman, you know, make eye contact with her, beautiful woman, walk past her in the street. I'm not saying you have to make eye contact, but sometimes, you know, you happen to look at a woman. If you immediately take your face and look the other way, you're embarrassed. If you're embarrassed, it shows that she's stronger than you, that her beauty is stronger than you. If you can walk up to a beautiful woman and talk to her and have confidence, look her in the eye, you know, that shows you're a really strong man. If you could do that, you can walk up to a woman. Not only that, but you can walk over and be confident and flirt with a woman and joke around with her and show, you know, flirting means, that's, you know, flirting means to talk down to a woman. That's what really flirting is when, you know, when you show you're above her 
you know, women love that when you talk down to them. That's what flirting is. You joke around in a not demeaning way, not in a, a way that you know is mean to them, but in a half deprecating way. You know, so that's really what flirting is. That attracts a woman. Men, women love men that are stronger than them, that are strong. You know, and the biggest strength is to be stronger than them when it comes to uh, being attracted to them. That you're attracted to them. You want to show them you're attracted to them, but you are stronger than them. And it's very hard to reach that level. And that's why there's only a few good men in the world that actually get all the ladies. They really should get all the ladies. Andrew Tate is one of them. Um, we'll, talk, we'll talk about it. I'm going to talk about it. Well, other men, I think, are part of that category. Um, but this is the hardest challenge in life. But running away from physicality just represents a weakness. It doesn't represent a strength. And in the bedroom, you should, especially in a, in a long marriage, to freshen things up, you should invest heavily financially and time and thought into how you could achieve more enjoyment in the bedroom because that'll make the more enjoyment both the husband and wife have in the bedroom, the longer their marriage is going to last and the better their marriage will be. Hope you enjoyed today's lecture. See you in the next one.